Um, welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Katie Schreier. I am a junior here at the University of Dayton, double majoring in music and history. I'm an intern of the Human Rights Center where I've worked on projects like the Vietnam Legacies Project, and I'm currently researching how museums conduct advocacy on social justice and human rights issues. Um, tonight's recording, it session is going to be recorded and added to the UDigital and Alumni Association's YouTube playlists. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We have tried to work them into our session and we'll have time for additional Q&A at the end of the session. Tonight, we have the honor to meet an accomplished flyer that has received many accolades throughout her career. Essence Magazine referred to her as the Keeper of King's Legacy. She was named the 2020 Memphian of the Year, as well as the 2020 University of Dayton Alumni Award recipient of the Special Achievement Award. Welcome, Terry Lee Freeman. Thank you. Nice to be with you, Katie. Yeah, it's so nice to have you here. Um, Freeman graduated from UD in 1981 and majored in communication. She also has a master's in organizational communications management from Howard University. Throughout her professional career, Freeman has held leadership roles of the Freddie Mac Foundation, the Community Foundation for the National Capital Region, and the National Civil Rights Museum. She's also served on the board of directors for a number of nine. Took over as the executive director of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture. So, Terry, from one flyer to another, why did you decide to attend UD for your undergrad? Well, you know, at the time I, um, I spent my senior year in high school in Detroit, even though I was born and raised in Chicago. And um, we looked at a variety of schools. I had gotten information about UD at a college fair, actually. And, you know, I didn't really have any preferred schools. So I just started choosing brochures as I found them. And Dayton looked interesting. And um, we came down for a visit and I fell in love with the campus. And that was all she wrote. So I didn't want to go to a huge school. I didn't want to go to a tiny school. So UD was kind of right in the sweet spot of what I wanted to do. And it wasn't too far um, from home, about a three hour drive. So it, it, it just fit all the boxes. Nice, I can definitely relate to coming to campus and just falling in love with it. Mm -hmm. um, any favorite flyer memory you'd like to share with us? Well, I, you know, I was, I was very active when I came to UD. I actually um, started uh, a black dance troupe on campus called Shades, Shades of Black. And um, I also was a flyerette um, when I was at UD. And um, I was a member of, I pledged a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. So I stayed pretty busy. Um, while I was on campus. And my senior year, I did have a little job. Um, I don't even remember the name of the mall, but um, working at Sears in the mall, which I'm sure doesn't exist any longer since Sears has gone out of business. Um, but I, I just really enjoyed UD and the entire campus experience. Nice. Um, how has your UD experience impacted your professional career? Well, you know, I, I, I am one of those people who believes that undergrad basically teaches, pe teaches you and tells other people that you're trainable, that you can actually stick with something and do it, right? So I think that I learned some basic principles that allowed me to be able to, you know, begin a project, find the middle to the project, and end the project. Um, and I think those, I also think it helped me develop leadership skills because I was the president of um, our AKA chapter for a couple years while I was on campus. So it helped me develop leadership skills and that all came into play in grad school and then after grad school in the world, in the world of work. Nice. Mm -hmm. It's always great to see how UD lays the framework for growing and developing over time in your professional mm -hmm. career. So as mentioned, you've held many leadership positions. So we have a few questions around your career. What are factors that you look for when considering a career opportunity? Well, for me, it was really about what I wanted to do. So initially I was, um, I was a journalism major <clears throat> when I was at UD and communication arts. And after graduating, kind of realized that I wasn't certain that I wanted to do newspaper writing. I hadn't taken the broadcast um, route. I was really focused on print media. 
little did I know that, you know, 40 years from, from then, print media would be almost out of business, um, frankly. But I, I, I love to write. So I thought, well, what about going to grad school and <clears throat> going on to get a, a degree in business communication? So ultimately, for me, it was about what I enjoyed doing. I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed public speaking. Um, and it was a nice uh, way to kind of mix what I had done in undergrad with what I was doing in grad school. And I actually got a job right in corporate communications. Um, but after that, you know, I would say that I kind of fell into the career path that um, the career that led me on the path that I'm, I'm on now, um, because I started in corporate communications. But when Freddie Mac became a quasi public entity, um, we decided to have a community relations program and they asked me if I would manage that program. And it's kind of the rest was history. Once I started doing that community relations work, I realized that it allowed me to really learn more about what was going on in the community. And at that time, um, our emphasis on the work that we were doing in community relations was with children. And I had a young family myself. So um, it, it really allowed me to kind of combine my personal interest with my professional um, work. And I do believe that people should spend time working, doing what they like, because we spend so much time doing it. So for me, it's, I've always been driven a little bit by the passion that I've had for community and being able to figure out how, how I can work within that realm. That's great. Yeah. Um, are there any non-negotiables that you have when choosing a career or a job? Well, um, I have to be able to have a little bit of fun. I mean, if it's boring, no, thank you. Uh, I mean, I think every, every person, and particularly when you're first starting, you always have to do some things that you don't love. I mean, I still don't love doing reporting, but I have to do it, right? Um, but ultimately, um, I think I have to be able to have some fun. And I have to, at this point in my life, know that I'm making some contribution that is going to benefit um, the community or others in, in some way. Yeah, that's great. Um, so from 2014 until January 2021, you were the president of the National Civil Rights Museum, and you recently took over as the executive director of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture. So how did you make the transition from working for major foundations like the Community Foundation for the National Capital Region to leadership roles at museums? Sure. So first, I think I have to say, I certainly have chosen places to work at that have really long names. So you can <laughs> you can call the, the museum that I'm at now the Lewis. That's, that's what we call it usually. Um, so how did I make that change? Well, um, you know, I, Freddie Mac, I was there for 13 years with the last, let's say, last six years focused on that community relations and the corporate foundation. So that's how I got into philanthropy. I left Freddie Mac and went to the community foundation where I was for 18 years. And that is a long time by anybody's measure, particularly today when people don't stay in jobs for that long, typically any longer. And so I knew that it was about time for me to figure out what my next step and what my ne next path was. I also knew that when you are at the top of an organization in uh, a field like philanthropy, the moving is difficult because one, usually there are, are, well, not usually, there are fewer positions at that level, right? More positions in philanthropy in general, but fewer at the top of the organization. Um, so you have to wait for someone to leave or you have to go outside of um, the area that you have um, built your career. So uh, for me, the opportunity to work at the National Civil Rights Museum when it presented itself, it felt as though it would give me the opportunity to take everything that I had learned while I was making grants and raising money at the same time, 
but really to be able to actualize doing the work on the ground in a way. While I wasn't working at a direct service organization, while I wasn't working at an advocacy organization, I was working in an institution that provided a platform for me to talk about issues that were important to the community, but also for me to allow other people to use that platform to continue to push forward um, issues of you know, justice and um, um, freedom and just ensuring that people have the rights that they should have based on their citizenship and based on their being human beings. And so, um, I, I really felt at that point in my career that it was important for me to be able to um, have a point of view on some of these issues and use the institution um, that actually is, was in existence because of a terrible tragedy against um, an individual, but against humanity. Um, and all that um, was peaceful and right and just to be able to push forward an agenda for peace, righteousness, and just justice. So um, that was really exciting to me. And I learned a, a lot of new things while I was in that realm because I didn't have a museum studies background. Um, I've always enjoyed museums. But um, it really was more about that kind of social and racial justice platform that I would have at that museum. And then in trans transitioning to the Lewis, I still have that opportunity, but um, the museum's uh, issue areas are a little bit broader than simply um, civil, and I shouldn't say simply, but broader than civil. And oh, that's amazing. What are your some of your favorite moments from being the director of this, these museums? Wow, I, I've met some incredible people. Um, if I do say so myself, I, I met you know, gosh, you name them: Andy Young, John Lewis, Ava DuVernay, um, Susan Taylor, Jim James, um, Reverend Lowry, um, C.T. Vivian, uh, Bernice King. Um, um, all these incredible, incredible people, Joe Biden, um, Jill Biden, and the, you know, the list just goes on and on of incredible people who have done incredible things in, in, their, um, in their lifetime. Um, and, and to sit and have the opportunity to talk with these people and learn, um, learn from them, I, um, you know, I, I actually even developed a friendship with Jesse Jackson. And, you know, these are so interesting because many of these people, they really love to talk about their story. They love to tell you about the path that they took and what it was like to do the work that they did um, when they did it. And then to be able to meet some contemporary people like Ibram X. Kendi, um, you know, and um, some other April Ryan and Tamron Hall and, you know, just people who are, who we see on a, on a regular basis through the media that we use, but to be able to talk with them and get to know them a little bit. Um, I think of, of particular um, note for me, uh, one of the people that I met that I was the most impressed with actually was Fair Khan. Um, and his, he is, his manner is very different um, than what people perceive. But what's interesting about that meeting was the first time I met him, I was at the University of Dayton because he came to UD as a speaker. So it was kind of a full circle um, experience in a way. But I would have to say being able to meet those individuals and just listen to their stories, incredible experience. Yeah, that's a really incredible list of people you've gotten to meet. And speaking of incredible people, you've been referred to as the keeper of King's legacy, and that's a pretty heavy title to carry. Have you ever felt over overwhelmed by such an important title? Oh, definitely. I mean, the weight of that place, um, if you've never been to the National Civil Rights Museum in, in Memphis, I would encourage you to go. I do think it's it's a trip that everyone um, should make, and I'm, I can guarantee you 
that um, you will be changed in some way after you go visit that museum. But, you know, walking past that balcony every day, um, it, the weight of what happened there. And you think about the reason why King was in Memphis, what he was fighting for, and that was motivation enough to say, okay, you got to keep on fighting for, um, you know, racial and, and social justice. You got to keep fighting for economic equity. You've got to keep fighting for educational equity. You got to make sure the voting rights are, are not stolen from people because the people on the walls of that museum fought so hard and experienced such excuse me, experience such terror, um, just trying to secure the rights that they deserved. I, I did in many ways feel that I had a responsibility to ensure that what we were doing at that place and in that space uh, would have been in line with what they um, had accomplished over their lifetimes. Yeah. Um... Are there any practices or ideals from MLK that can guide today's citizens as I continue to fight for human rights? Well, yes. I mean, I think that people, people think of King and they think of peaceful protest, and that certainly was uh, what he was known for. But what I think people need to understand is that um, he was still um, an activist. He was still a radical. He believed in the things that he believed in. And um, many people, you know, there are lots of um, conspiracies around Dr. King's assassination. Um, you know, the, 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 it really started to get hot, if you will, when he started talking about um, capitalism, militarism, and racism as the three evils of our country, in particular, the whole issue around the Vietnam War. And uh, when he came out against Johnson um, on that point, many people felt that he, he was betraying the movement because Johnson was a friend of the movement. And I guess, I think that, that his position is, um, important and can be helpful as people decide to do organizing and work in community is that he stood on his beliefs and was not, he was not intimidated by those people who said, you can't stand on your beliefs, you have to do what's going to be, um, what, what was his, in one speech, he talked about doing what was politic, right? Um, do what you should do, stay in your lane. And that's what he heard a lot. But he had to stand on um, he, what he felt was uh, the moral imperative. And the moral imperative was to do what was right for, for all people. Um, and I think that if we all st stood on our moral imperative, I think we would see our country, our nation move in a little bit of a different direction and not be, not be persuaded by what we think is politic, not worry about what people say about you on social media, but just stand, stand on, um, on those things that you believe are right um, and remember that you have personal integrity um, that you always have to um, ensure is intact. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, do you have a particular proud moment from your time at the National Civil Rights Museum? We already touched on this a bit, but if there's anything else you'd like to share? Well, I think likely I should all, I, I say this every time someone asks me this, I should always say that my most proud moment was the 50th commemoration of Dr. King's assassination because it was a huge to do. <laughs> um, it was a year long commemoration that um, culminated that, excuse me, those few days of uh, April 2nd, 3rd and 4th with the 4th being the date of his assassination. Um, and that's when we had all of those icons came back um, to the Lorraine Motel. And um, we had the people who I called your new movement makers, those people who were, are out there today uh, as we're looking at the movement for Black Lives and um, you know, Me Too and all of these other movements that were taking place. So we had all of these people there culminating in uh, just 
looking backwards, but looking backwards to look forward, to be able to progress forward. So I, I feel like I should always say that that was my, my most proud moment to actually have gotten through that, that, <laughs> that commemoration. But for me, uh, the proudest moment was the creation of a seven month long dialogue series called, um, 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 I'm trying to think of the name of the session now, Unpacking Racism for Action. And it was seven months of a cohort-based program where people applied for the program and it went deep into implicit bias and structural racism. That for me was uh, my proudest moment because over the course of the four years that we did that program, um, we had more and more people who wanted to apply. We actually got people um, saying that it, the, the, the sessions had truly changed how they looked at the issues of bias, um, racism, um, and even how they dealt with people uh, differently after that. So those are the things that I'm most proud of. Yeah, those are some great projects and it's really cool to see museums as a site where this can happen. Mm -hmm. So younger generations, including myself, tend to focus on issues that affect them in the moment. How can museums strive to be more relevant? Well, well, you were you were breaking up just a little bit for me, um, Katie. I'm hoping that you can um, hear me still. Um, I I look at museums as being places that serve as meeting places and public gathering places um, where. I don't, I don't want to say we're neutral. I don't believe that museums are neutral. I believe that once you um, step out on a topic, you actually are making a statement by saying that that topic is worthy of your time. But I do feel like it can be a, a bit of a non-judgment zone um, and that you can open up conversation and dialogue um, in these places. Um, in a way that it is more comfortable for the variety of people that would consider your place a space that is, if you will, a safe space. And I do think you, you talked about issues of the moment. Usually though, issues of the moment are a part of a bigger issue, right? So it, it's never just the issue of, a, of the moment. It's, it's how you look at that particular issue. And so um, I think that museums, have a really important role to play, particularly, particularly museums that talk about history and culture of, um, of disenfranchised populations. So, you know, museums that focus on those people who one might call minorities um, in this country, that history and the and the experience of those people um, in America. Um, it becomes really important to highlight and to and to present so that everybody can understand um, their experience. So, the, I I don't think that yeah, museums are do serve the purpose of just furthering um, a an appreciation of art, an appreciation of culture, an appreciation of history, but they also should serve a purpose of um, inspiring and encouraging people to act in some way based on the knowledge that they gain through their visit to the museum. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, before I ask the next question, I just wanna remind the audience that they can submit questions through the Q&A box at any time and we'll get to them at the end. So talking more about museums, um, they're, truth tellers of our history. So should we support them even if the history is a negative? Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, no, no, what history is all positive. Um, I, you know, and, and I think that's what, I mean, you have to take the good with the bad. Um, let me give you an example. Um, as we talked about Confederate statues, and what should be done with Confederate statues, um, I am. I was not a proponent of having statues 
of people who were committing treason. <laughs> I mean, you know, they were. Um, and uh, But once the statue existed, I thought it should be put in a place where the story could be interpreted correctly. So that we're not just talking about these people for, the, for what we thought was their heroism, but that we are talking about the full story of, um, you know, in Memphis, Nathan Bedford Forrest. You have to tell the whole story of Nathan Bedford Forrest. You can't just talk about him as a war hero. You do have to talk about him as one of the founders of the KKK. You do have to talk about him as a slave trader. And, and it is important for people to understand the whole story. And for, for so long, um, we have been getting pieces of the story, you know, you, 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 especially as it relates to the African-American experience in, in, this, in this country. And so um, I think that you do have to tell the, the ugly truth the good truth, the bad truth, but you have to tell the truth. Right. Yeah, that's something I've learned as a history major here. There's no totally positive parts of history. Um, so the next question is museum and social justice conversation while staying in or political. Okay, so I lost you a little bit, but I think, make sure I'm answering the question that you were asking, how do we talk about some of these issues without being political? Uh, yeah, correct. Okay. Um, yes, I, am I well, frozen? <laughs> well, I think that we do have to, um, I don't think that we should really be focused on political politics with a big P, but I do think we have to talk about policy. And I think we have to recognize that some of the reason we're in the places that we're in now is because of policy decisions that were made by whatever political party that have had a negative impact on certain communities. Um, and so while I would never be a proponent inside of the museums that I'm managing of talking about political parties other than saying, let's talk about the two party system and maybe begin to think outside of the box. I'm not going to be one who says pro or con for either of the particular parties. And I'm not going to say pro or con uh, with regard to political candidates, but I will talk about good policy and bad policy and go deep into good policy and bad policy and why things don't work for community and why some things do work for community. That's the role that I think we should play. Now, I'm not gonna say that if I'm having a public program and somebody wants to talk about a political candidate, I'm not gonna shut them down from doing that. But my approach would not be then to come back and talk more about the political candidate, but really focus on the policies that you know created inequitable healthcare systems. In, in our country. Um, th that's the way I think uh, it's most effective because once you start getting into personalities, people just kind of shut down. Yeah, that's a great perspective to have. Um, final question about museums, just kind of overall what we've been talking about, how can museums be more inclusive? Well, that's a really good question because let's face it, some of our um, cultural institutions um, really have op operated out of a very paternalistic, um, a very capitalist type of system. So that while they were public spaces, they weren't always welcoming to everybody, right? And I think that museums have, have begun to, to um, turn that corner. Um, I think that we have to look at <clears throat> sources of funding for uh, museums. Um, if your sources of funding only come from large funders and you have no individual base, then you don't necessarily feel like you have anything that you have to do for the individuals, right? You're focused on those larger um, entity. So I think it's a balance um, um, for, for organizations. So diversifying the funding 
is one way that you can increase diversity in the museum. The other is frankly, just hire some people that look different than you. I mean, really, there are, you know, after the whole George Floyd situation and talking with corporations and, you know, we can't find anybody, you know, I don't accept that. I don't even want to hear that excuse. Um, because you can find people if you want to find people. You can um, groom people if you want to groom people. You can mentor people if you want to mentor people. Or how about this? Where's your banking relationship? You can have a banking relationship at an institution that is not an all white led institution. Um, what about your, um, uh, in, in the philanthropic arena, Who's doing your investment management for all those big assets? Did you ever think that you might want to look at a minority or women-led woman -led firm to manage your assets? You, that's the way we spread wealth. It's not just about what the rank and file look like. It's about where the money is going. So I think if you want true diversity, you have to look at diversifying every level and layer of the organization. And yes, that includes the board, the governing um, um, boards of these institutions as well, because they're the ones that make a lot of those incredibly important and powerful financial decisions. And that to me is where you begin to level the playing field. When we start talking about the money and who's getting a piece and a slice of the pie, that's when we start to actually um, create equity. Yeah, absolutely. So now we're going to go into our Q&A portion um, and you got um, the participants can still submit questions at any time through the Q&A box. Our first question is, how does an organization create buy-in from the community, a product that generates funding in order to continue preserving, collecting, and showcase local history? Well, I think, well, so there, I think there are a couple of ways you can do it. First of all, you can have, and <clears throat> we're just beginning to do this a little bit, you can have the community curate exhibits. You can have them actually, um, you can take a topic and you can have them actually curate the exhibit. So um, back in 2017, I think it was, I don't recall when Philando Castile was murdered, um, the, the Dallas a shooting occurred where police officers were killed and there was one more gentleman who was killed in Little Rock, I want to say, somewhere around there. Um, we actually created an exhibit that was a chain link fence and I did a blog called Stolen Lives and we asked people to write on index cards their experience with um, gun violence, violence of any type. And so what we did was we created a chain link fence <clears throat> that ended up having um, the voices of the community on it, as well as artifacts that the community left behind on the chain link fence. So community curation is one way of doing it. I think that you can do um, events that bring people into the museum and ask people to support the organization with small contributions. It doesn't have to be a lot, um, but it should be community um, activities. So if you do um, book fairs or if you do health fairs or if you do um, some organizations even do a call for artifacts and they help the individuals who bring the artifacts better understand what their artifacts are, to know what you have in, in the attic or what Aunt Jane handed down and, and what value that had is another way of getting people to feel like they're a part of these big institutions that have these huge collections, where in fact, we only have collections because of the individuals in um, the community. So I think those are some of the ways that you can actually get community buy-in. Yeah, those are some really cool projects. I'd love to see the chain link fence. That sounds incredible. Um, our next question is, can you please explain the significance of African-American history in mainstream museums, such as county public museums and other prestigious museums? Well, I, I guess the, the short answer to that is the significance is that we've always been there, no matter where we are in, in the country. Um, we've always been there. So to make sure that we are telling the full story, we have to tell the stories 
of black and brown people, right? Um, and I think if, if people would get over the fact that the, the history is not pretty um, and just tell the truth and inform people uh, about what has happened in smaller jurisdictions or um, state-based museums. You know, the, the Lewis is um, a state museum that talks about um, African-American history and culture within the state of Maryland. <clears throat> and Maryland has had a very interesting history in the nation's history, but also with African-Americans. I mean, you think of some of the people that have come out of Maryland, huge figures like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, um, huge figures like Billie Holiday and U.B. Blake. And so there are, <clears throat> there's a lot, and many, many others, obviously, um, but there are a lot, there's a lot of story to be told. And the state's history or the county's history is richer by telling the entire story. Um, and I think <clears throat> museums are coming to terms with the fact that what they do is tell stories. They are storytellers. And when you think of, of these institutions as places where we preserve and tell stories, it becomes easier to understand. You know, it's like sitting down at the foot of your grandparents, listening to um, their experiences. Well, that's what you get in these institutions, but you shouldn't get a sugar-coated version of it. You should get the real truth about the situation. So people leave with um, a newfound interest in what makes the place that they call home, home. Yeah. That's amazing. All right. The next question is, how do you keep yourself educated? Any pieces of literature you would recommend to other individuals? Wow. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I read a fair amount. Um, I, I, my personal preference is to read fiction, but that's not going to inform me about anything. So what I try to do is I'll read fiction and then I'll read nonfiction. Um, <clears throat> but I have read um, some, well, here's what, working at the National Civil Rights Museum, to read King's writings is to better understand him. Because otherwise, you're gonna think King basically did two speeches. The speech at the March on Washington, I have a dream and the mountaintop speech. <clears throat> you may have a little bit of knowledge about um, um, the letter from Birmingham jail. You may have a little knowledge about, um, um, oh, I'm trying to think what the, there's one talk about, talking about remaining awake during a revolution. Um, but there's so much more to him. And so when you read his books, you really get a better sense of who he was and what the, what the movement um, was like. But I guess I would encourage anyone um, who wants to know more about a period in time to identify the individuals that you want to know more about. And then take it from there, either through a Google search or books that are dedicated to that particular topic. And usually it will lead you into other areas. I mean, one of, um, one of the, the books that I read that was really interesting was called From the Ballot, From the, From the, From the Ballot to the Bullet. Um, and it was about the period of time between the Voting Rights Act and um, the Panther Party. And it, it was just a fascinating read because it told me the truth about the Panther Party, not what people tell you about the Black Panthers. Um, so I would, I would first encourage people, because <clears throat> not everybody's reads that way, um, find a museum that talks about these difficult topics of history. And then you can go deeper by uh, learning more about the individuals that are reflected in those particular museums. Yeah, this is some great- Oh, and I, I, oh let me just add this too, Katie. And I do love documentaries. 
I absolutely love documentaries because they bring it to life. You can read a story and you can use your imagination, but when you um, when you are actually able to see it, it's almost like you're participating in it. Um, one of my favorite um, documentaries about Dr. King is one called King in the Wilderness, and it's about the last year of King's life. Um, if, if it gives you, it just makes so plain how difficult um, his journey was that final year, and it really um, puts a spotlight not just on the fact that King was, you know, disliked by many people. <clears throat> Um, in the white community, but King was disliked by many people in the black community. And it's a really interesting um, story, King in the Wilderness. Wow, that's on. Um, Arnett, we have not a question, but a kind of soror. Terry, you're doing an awesome job on the webcast. Congratulations, such a wealth of information. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, the next question is, does the Reginald Blue Museum hire college interns? What do you look for in an intern? And are there virtual opportunities as well as in-person opportunities? You know, so I have been there all of seven weeks um, now, so I'm still very new um, at the Lewis, but yes, um, we do have interns. Now, right now, we only have um, two interns and understand, <clears throat> you know, the museum was closed for a while. Um, we had to um, lay off staff. And when you're in a situation where you have to lay off staff, it's really hard to bring in interns, right? Because you want to be loyal to the people who have been working for the institution. But once able to, to um, get people back into the museum, yes, interns are a really important part um, of, I think, museum culture. Um, for in, in, in every um, element of the work. And what I tell people is, you know, if you're interested in marketing, you can still look at a museum internship because we have to do marketing. If you're interested in finance, you can still work at a museum as an intern because we have a finance department. If you're interested in history, of course, we've got the, the curators. So um, <clears throat> yes, it's an important part. It's um, added. Um, it's ad added talent. Um, and we, in we like to make sure that we're giving interns really important work to do that is going to, to really help them in their career. Um, and I encourage, I encourage all students to do internships, but make sure that they, well, and I also believe in paid internships, right? We should not be asking people to do free free labor. Um, so we, they they may not be, you know, a lot of money, but you ought to be getting something, some type of payment for the work that you are providing because that's going to stay there with that institution. Yeah, absolutely. Very much a proponent of paid internships as a student. Um, <laughs> next question is: Please speak to the significance of the newly named Jesse. A sorry, Jesse S. Hathcock Hall, and that she was a Black woman and the member of AKA. Well, you know what? I'm not familiar with it. I'm not familiar with it, so I can't speak to it at all. And I'm sorry, I would love to know more about it. Yeah, I don't know too much about it, but when, I think the new Computer Science Hall was named after her, and she was one of the first Black women to graduate from UD with a degree in that. I might well, be that is fabulous. I did not. I did not know that. Uh, that's real. So now I have to get back to UD just so I can see the building. Absolutely. Yeah, I haven't gotten to see it in person yet, but I saw the construction and it looked pretty good then. <laughs> um, so, okay. Yeah, first African American graduate. I got that part right. <laughs> that's great. So, yeah. Um, the next question is: How can museums come back stronger from the disruptive experience of the pandemic? Whew. Well, you know, I, I actually think we're going to do okay. Um, so the, the, the first issue, obviously, is that most of us had to just shut our doors, right? Um, so the first step is getting the doors open. The second uh, step is getting 
uh, some level of <clears throat> capacity back so that you can have people in your building. And some museums are more suited for people to be back in the, in the museums, in the spaces earlier than others. I think a lot of museums went from a walk up and just get a ticket to a time ticketing situation so that they could ensure that people were spaced out um, so that it was safe for, for people. Um, I think, I do think that most museums have effectively used virtual programming and kept people um, at least attuned of the type of work or the type of um, activity, history, culture, art that they display. And I think that that taught many of us um, that, wow, we can reach a lot more people through this virtual platform. That said, um, we live and die by people coming into the museum. So ultimately, what will be important is that we are able to get back to um, at least something close to the capacity that we had before. Um, and, and actually, I'm going to take that back because <clears throat> Um, at the National Civil Rights Museum, it actually used to get uncomfortably crowded. So uh, the fact that we have uh, time ticketing now will eliminate that and, and actually is something that will be beneficial in the long run. But I think that, I think um, cultural institutions are going to bounce back when people feel comfortable. Um, one of the things that I think we miss the most are the school buses. Um, and having children in the spaces because that's a big part of the business for uh, museums is having those school groups come in from early childhood all the way up through, frankly, spring break with colleges um, visiting um, our institutions. But, but I think it's going to come back and I think we're gonna be prepared um, for, for people to come back with uh, programming, with great ex exhibitions, but also with programming that is both in-person and virtual. Yeah, great. Um, going off of that question, do you see a greater diversity of visitors to the museum in recent years? Oh, um, so I haven't, I can't speak to the Lewis yet because we have so, it's really, really, our attendance is really low right now. But um, the, the level of diversity at the National Civil Rights Museum is quite significant. And while I would say, you know, actually, the data went back and forth for us. Um, sometimes we would see that we had majority of our visitors were African American. And other times we would see that the majority of our vi visitors were um, white. And then we had all sorts of visitors in between. And, and we used to get a lot of international visitors as well. That I don't think is gonna come back right away, not the international visitors, but um, people that can drive to the museum, they're gonna to get to the museum and it is a very, very diverse crowd. Okay, that's great. Um, let me see, next question is, Oh, some additional information. Jessie Hathcock was the first African-American female graduate. She was also the founder of Beta Eta Omega, the oh, AKA graduate. Chapter. Look at me, I'm supposed to yeah. know that, right? It's been a long time. So whoever put that up there, I just celebrated my 42nd anniversary in the sorority. So it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. Um, Okay, next question is, what museum is missing from today's environment? And if you have an opportunity to create a museum of your choosing, what would it be? I'm sure that this museum exists because there's probably a museum on every topic you could probably think of. But I think the, the, the fierce urgency of climate, I think it deserves a museum. <laughs> I think to talk about um, the evolution, and I'm sure that, you know, museums of science do include this, but something that really talked about the climate challenges um, that we're facing. In fact, one would think that maybe Al Gore would be involved in some type of uh, um, uh, an effort to do something like that. Um, but I think that that's really important. And there are 
<clears throat> women's museums that have popped up all over the country. So I think that looking at women's contributions has certainly become something that we're doing through um, the, the museum sphere. I'll tell you what museum I wish would come back um, is the museum. Um, the museum that was about the news. And it was um, in Washington, D.C. It closed down a couple of years ago. They said they were going to reopen in a different place, in a different format. But it was a fabulous, especially for, for news junkies and for uh, journalism students, it was a, a fabulous museum, probably, don't tell anybody, my favorite museum was probably the museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember the news museum opening up fresh wounds. <laughs> so sad it's gone. Um, right. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. The final question before we get to your closing thoughts is what is the legacy you would like to leave behind? You know, one of the things that I say, um, well, it's actually in my bio, I say that what is important is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And um, my hope is that what people will say is that I made some contribution to um, the community or I made some contribution to the people that I was able to hire and that I was able to allow um, uh, people to develop into their leadership skills. Because ultimately, that's going to be what's important, what I leave behind, not so much what I have done over the course of um, my career. Um, and it, it sounds, it probably sounds pretty trite when you say you really just want to make sure that you've made an impact, but that's it. I just want to know that, I want to know that my kids and my family can be proud of the work that I have done and that I poured into um, somebody else uh, to give back in a lot of ways for what was poured into me. Yeah, it's amazing. All right, Terry, thank you so much for your thoughts, your insight and your willingness to contribute to this discussion and talk with us. Any last thoughts you'd like to share with our attendees? I guess the only thing that I would say, Katie, and thank you, you've been a fabulous interviewer. Um, is I hope people understand that we never stop learning um, and that while we may only uh, engage in formal education for a season, um, the informal education continues for a lifetime. Um, and we're never too old um, to make the decision to change a direction. We should never be afraid to do that. So um, I, I just keep keep an open mind um, about all those things that you're interested in doing and try to do just a fraction of them. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today, Terry. And thank you to all of our attendees who have listened in. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Go Flyers. Thank you. Thank you.